I want to bring in our own Ashley Webster, who joins us now, along with Cato Institute senior fellow uh, Dan Mitchell. And, and mm -hmm. Ashley, certainly the, those meetings with auto executives today to Blake's point, the first real industry that he seems to be focusing on. But can the auto industry deliver jobs when we might see a projected slowdown in vehicle sales? Yeah, in 2017? you know, that's a very good point, Cheryl. We've come off some bumper numbers for the auto industry. But what do you do? Do you punish uh, these uh, companies that produce, especially small cars, in Mexico because it's the cheaper way to go or do you have to hike your prices and then become uh, you know less competitive with the other automakers around the world it's a difficult one it's the automakers and the retailers I believe who get a lot of their products uh, brought in from overseas the Walmarts and the uh, the targets and so on that will also be hurt badly by this so-called border adjustment tax or tariff or whatever you want to call it yeah, Dan, that is a, a fair point there. The economics of a border tax, the economics of the tariffs uh, that Donald Trump, the president, is talking about now, in particular with automakers. I mean, we have a small, we have manufacturing in the United States, but a lot of that manufacturing still is in Mexico, and that does keep prices cheaper for the American consumer. That's a push pull. How do we reconcile that? Mm. Well, the first thing to understand is that there are actually two different proposals out there. Trump is talking about just old-fashioned tariffs, and Republicans in the House, as part of their tax reform plan, have this so-called border adjustable tax, which would mean a 20 percent tax on everything imported into the country. And that has, of course, retailers and other people very agitated. Here's my bottom line in terms of jobs and manufacturing. Trump has this carrot and stick approach. He's saying we're going to lower the corporate tax rate. We're going to do other things to roll back the regulatory burden. My view is if he does everything in the carrot pile, he doesn't need to do the stick pile. We don't need to yeah. run a risk of a repeat of the 1930s with protectionism if he simply gets rid of the bad government policy that hurts the American economy right now. Ashley, you agree with that? I do. I mean, in a perfect world, they'll all take the carrot, won't they, and won't uh, be uh, forced to uh, feel the, uh, the sting of the, uh, the bat. Um, the question is, is it realistic? Uh, I, w I, like anyone else, would love to have all the manufacturing jobs come back here. Good paying jobs. Don't want people having three part-time jobs. We want people to have good, full benefits, full-time jobs. The question is, can these industries do it and remain competitive? If they can, all the better. Well, Dan, and that's, that's an interesting point about the auto, auto industry in particular. The last two years have been good years, but gas prices mm -hmm. have been lower. We are expecting, in particular thanks to OPEC, we're going to see higher prices this year in 2017. And the auto industry has been hiring. They have now hired 50 percent since the bottom of the financial re uh, recession. They have now brought back all of the, those jobs. I mean, that's, that's the where we're at today, but can they be pushed much higher if the sales aren't going to be there, if the customers aren't going to be there? Two things to focus on, I think. First, some bad news. In the long run, we are losing manufacturing jobs everywhere, not just the United States, China, Europe, Japan, uh, simply because of productivity, uh, automation, uh, robots. And so even if we had the best policy in the world, we're probably not going to have as many manufacturing jobs 10 years from now as we do now. But that's in some sense uh, a testament to the efficiency and innovation uh, of industry all around the world. Uh, but here's the good news. I might as well sort of end with a happy uh, story <laughs> here. Uh, if Trump succeeds in rolling back some of the anti-energy policies we saw during the Obama years, it doesn't matter what OPEC tries to do. OPEC mm -hmm. can only succeed as a cartel if they actually control all the supply. But the U.S. is now such a major producer, and we've had some deregulation and, and more competition. Mm -hmm. I don't think OPEC really has that great power. So if we have low energy prices, if we fix some of the terrible warts in our tax system, uh, I think the future can be reasonably bright. And we've seen some key energy names actually on the markets today uh, moving higher thanks to that executive order from the president uh, restarting uh, the, uh, the, the pipelines for Dakota and for uh, Keystone. So that's, that's some good news as well for, for market participants. Ashley, mm. Dan, thank you very much.